Let's get started here. So uh, project number one is due one week from today at class time. And test number two, if you are looking ahead, is three weeks from today. So it's coming up. Are there also, um, unfortunately, my office hours are canceled after class. However, if you do need to talk to me, I can talk to you briefly right here if, if needed. I will be in my office, though, in the afternoon if you need to uh, so come talk to me. Are there any questions before we get started here? Okay, so we were talking about principal component analysis last time. And just to review a little bit, in case it was a long weekend. Um, so uh, with principal component analysis, what we're trying to do is find linear combinations of, uh, let's say, a set of original variables. These linear combinations are called principal components. And they're found in such a way that you're trying to explain as much information about the data as possible through each linear combination. And when I say information, I'm also equivalently talking about informa uh, information. I'm also equivalently talking about variance. And uh, our hope is that maybe we could just work with a few of these new variables called principal components rather than all of our original variables. And thus, essentially, we are reducing the dimension of our data problem. And maybe from instead of working with 10 variables, maybe we can work with three. The smaller number of variables that we have, the easier it will be to make sense of your data. So here's uh, how we find these, um, these principal components, these linear combinations. So y hat star sub j represents the j principal component. And it's equal to this vector a hat star sub j times z. Okay. z is a vector of our standardized original variables. a hat star sub j uh, corresponds to eigenvectors from our correlation matrix, or estimated correlation matrix, where this is the j eigenvector, which uh, comes from the jth eigenvalue. Jth largest, that is. So that's our general formula. So in, in essence, what's happening here is you're taking, uh, let's say, A1J at star times your first standardized variable plus we go all the way down to the pth um, component of A. Oops. So there's our linear combination. Where I'm simply writing out the components of the A hat star vector and multiplying by the corresponding components of the um, of the z oops, vector. <coughs> um, also, we can write this all out in terms of, for let's say, the rth uh, observation. So r is equal to 1 to n. We have n different observations. And these are called the principal component scores. So for every observation, we can come up with one of these y hat star sub so rj's. And j actually goes from 1 to p. So you could actually have p different principal components. Again, the hope is that you're going to have something a lot less than p that's really necessary, that you have to actually work with. OK. So in the notes, we had just, started, uh, we had, uh, just uh, uh, discussed how we can have R do some of the calculations. So just to briefly review, um, there's a function R called print comp. If we use print comp with the serial data, this is how we can get uh, R to do the corresponding calculations, or one way that we can have it do the corresponding calculations. So we can say formula equal tilde, the three variables that we're interested in, sugar, fat, and sodium. 
Data is in serial. I'm going to use a correlation matrix. So I'm going to put a true there. You also want some principal component scores as well. So I'm going to put scores equal true. And we can summarize the information that that's stored in the resulting object called PCA.save through using the summary function. So I say summary PCA.save, loading is equal true. In principal component analysis, uh, typically the word loadings refers to these eigenvectors in terms of the, the components of the eigenvectors because essentially the components of the eigenvectors are, are, the, uh, are the, what's forming the linear combination with the original variables. So they're kind of loading the original variables. Um, and then the cutoff equals zero says I want all these loadings actually printed no matter what their value is. By default, R will print what will not print uh, these any any loadings that are uh, less than uh, uh, 0.1 in absolute value. So if you have a negative 0.05, it won't actually print that loading. And I want everything printed, so that's why I did cut off equal zero. And so what we have here in the output then is some important information. So this right here, for example, it's a square root of lambda hat star 1. In other words, it's the largest eigenvalue from the correlate, estimated correlation matrix square root. Does anyone remember why uh, this is labeled? Obviously, for comp 1, that makes sense why that would be lambda hat 1. Uh, but why is that lo labeled next to standard deviation, the standard deviation row? Lambda hat star 1 is the variance for the first principal component. So take the square root of it, you got um, the standard deviation. Then we have lambda hat star 2 square root. Now the next two rows then tell, give us some information to help decide well, how many principal components do we need. Again, our hope is that we don't need all P. If so we need all P, might as well just work with the original variables. Um, and so what we have here is information about the proportion of variance that a particular principal component takes into account, and also then the cumulative proportion. So what we have here is lambda hat star 1 divided by 3. Does anyone know why I have 3 there? Anyone remember why I have 3, I should say? I have 3 variables, but... Because the trace is the variance. The trace is the matrix, the covariance matrix for... The trace of the correlation matrix is 3. Exactly. So the trace of the correlation matrix is 3. Now, why is that important? Well, remember, the correlation matrix for the original variables is exactly the same as the correlation matrix for the standardized variables, and that's exactly the same as the covariance matrix for the standardized variables. So if you look at the diagonal elements of your, of your covariance matrix for the standardized variables, you have variances. And so since they're standardized variables, those variances have to be equal to 1. And so one of the goals then of principal component analysis, or, or a way to help determine how many principal components should we have, is to look at the total variance possible. In other words, the sum of what's on those diagonal of that covariance matrix. And try to explain as much of that variation, or account for as much of that variation as possible. So the first principal component accounts for 44% of the total variation. How much variation does just one of the original standardized variables account for? What proportion of variance? Of the total variance, I should say. Each of the original standardized variables has a variance of? One. And the sum of the variances is three. So one-third. So notice here that first principal component is really not accounting for that much more 
of the total variation than if you were just to stick with your original variables to begin with. Okay? The second principal component, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. The second principal component counts for 31%. So it's actually accounting for less variability than an original variable would. The proportion of variance then that the first three principal components take into account is this. Now I can't write today. Seventy-five percent. Well, that, that's that's good, but you know, again, think about what two of the original standardized variables would account for. About 67%. So what this is telling me then is that principal component analysis is not really helping out too much here. It's doing just a little bit better than working with just the regular old original variables to begin with. So because of that, principal component analysis is probably not worthwhile for this particular problem. Now let's relate this back to something that we saw last time. Here's my correlation matrix. Notice, as we talked about, notice that these correlations are quite kind of close to zero. And because of that, and because of how principal component analysis works, um, this is a, an expected result that we just had from looking at all those eigenvalues and stuff. That since there's not a whole lot of correlation between our original variables, but this is saying that these original variables are distinct. And if you want to know, if you want to understand your data, you have to basically treat these variables separately. You know, you need sugar, you need fat, you need sodium, because they are distinct elements of the data, and uh, there's not any kind of uh, strong associations between the variables. And so thus, because of that, in this principal component analysis, we should have expected it's not going to work out very well. And that's what happens here. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Yes. Each component still has all like sugar, fat, and sodium in it. So when do you, I guess, who will always have that? I want you to say that sometimes components, what is principal component that is made up of? Is that whatever? So it's close to zero. You just take it out. You know, it's only these two variables. Uh, I, 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 I think you're getting at what, what I'm going to be talking about next. Um, now, since principal component analysis is not really worthwhile for this data set, I would just simply stop there. But if one were to continue, one would want to understand. Well, what does principal component number one represent? I think that's what you're getting at. So what you do then is you come down to these loadings. So, for example, the first principal component could be written like this. Y hat 1 star is equal to negative 0.667 times the standardized sugar value. I'm just going to write sugar. Minus 0.588 times fat, standardized, plus 0.458 times sodium. So, excuse me. so if one were uh, wanting then to interpret this first principal component, meaning what does it represent in terms of our original variables, what do we have here? Well, we basically have, a, you know, it's a, it's a linear combination, and we have negative values on sugar and fat, and we have a positive value on sodium. So essentially what this is is a, some kind of contrast between sugar and fat versus sodium. Now, that would be one part of your interpretation. A second part is often much harder, and that is, well, what, why should this matter to have this kind of a linear combination? And that's where often a statistician might have problems interpreting that because they're not an expert in the subject matter itself. So this is where hopefully the subject matter researcher, 
non-statistician, uh, would come in and say, oh yeah, based upon what I know about nutrition and stuff like that, this makes sense to have this kind of a linear combination. Or they might say, I have no idea. And that can happen. And that's where interpreting these principal components can often be difficult. You're hoping that a particular linear combination that you see there, uh, beyond just simply a, so it's a contrast between sugar, fat versus sodium, you're hoping that linear combination makes sense in terms of the original problem. Well, let's take a look at principle component number two. Notice I have a positive for fat and sugar, but look at, I'm sorry, fat and sodium, but look at sugar, kind of close to zero. So it's really not contributing much. And remember, we're taking at times standardized data values in this linear combinations. So what does the second principal component represent? Well, simply it's some kind of overall measure of fat and sodium. That's, that will be the at least part of the interpretation. And again, hopefully in the context of the actual data problem itself, the subject matter researcher can come, come and look and say, oh yeah, that makes sense because of whatever reason, based upon their knowledge of, of nutrition and, and, and sugar, fat, and sodium and stuff. And you could do a similar, com uh, a similar interpretation for sh the, the third principal component too. So again, when we're looking at these interpretations, what, what you're doing is you're looking to see which ones are positive, which ones are negative, and which ones are perhaps close to zero. And at least you can say, I have a contrast, or I have some kind of overall measure of a particular thing. That's what you're looking for. And hopefully you can go a step farther and relate it to the actual um, uh, subject matter itself. Are there any questions? Okay, let's see here. So of course, you know, these eigenvectors, um, you know, eigenvectors are orthogonal to one another. So, you know, if you, if you look at, um, let's say, this eigenvector that's represented here, and multiply it by this eigenvector, of course, you get zero. Uh, what else do I have here written? These eigenvectors are a length of one. Remember, that was one of the... Uh, t towards actually the very beginning of this section, we need I we're working with eigenvectors that are length of one. Uh, on page twenty, we have a scree plot. And if you remember from last time, this is one of the ways that you can help determine how many principal components that one should have. You know, there's three ways. Uh, the first way is look at how many principal components are greater than one. I'm sorry how many of the uh, estimated eigenvalues are greater than one. Why? Well, remember again, an original variable has a variance of one when you're working with standardized data. So you would hope any principal components you have explain more information than an original variable itself. So you want for eigenvalues greater than one. Um, uh, second then, unfortunately now it's escaping me what the second one is. Um, oh, shoot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the cumulative proportion of the variance. You know, you're looking for it to explain, let's say, um, 80 percent, 90 percent of the overall variance. Once you achieve that, when you look at principal component one, principal component two, then you can say, okay, I'm going to stop. Two principal components are good because it explains, let's say, 80 percent of the total variance. Now, there isn't one magic number out there that I can give you that you want to have always greater than 80 percent or greater than 90%, or greater than 50%. I don't have a magic number out there. Obviously, the larger that percentage is, the better your principal component analysis is in terms of explaining the information about your data. Now, lastly, here's a scree plot. What we're looking at with respect to a scree plot is that you're hoping to see some kind of leveling off of the eigenvalues that are plotted there, and the, the leveling off also occurs to, at zero. Um, Perhaps I should start off by explaining uh, what's actually plotted. So we have this, um, uh, first of all, to do the plot, simply use the plot function, uh, put in your component from print comp, uh, say type equal lines, 
meaning you want lines plotted to connect some dots, and you can put a nice little title on your plot. On the y-axis here, we have variances. The, this represents lambda hat star sub j. So in other words, the estimated eigenvalues from the correlation matrix. Be very careful here when you look at that plot. Notice where it ends, 0.8 for this particular plot. But of course, these estimated eigenvalues can go all the way down to zero. So this can be a little bit misleading, the way that this plot was uh, um, uh, uh, drawn by default. And then what we have here is essentially j. So we have j equal 1, j equal 2, j equal 3. So the first eigenvalue was about one, a little bit greater than 1.3. The second eigenvalue was um, about 0.93 and so on. And what you're doing here, again, is you're looking for a leveling off of those eigenvalues. And this leveling off hopefully occurs around zero. And once you see that leveling off, it says, okay, I don't need any other I, I don't need any other principal components represented by eigenvalues that are, let's say, to the right on the plot. And you stop. In this case, though, we don't really see that. And so again, this is another sign that, yeah, this principal component analysis is probably not going to be very helpful to us. Okay. Let's talk about the PC scores. So the principal component scores. Again, something I, I mentioned at the beginning of class. What that means then is I want to find this for every single observation and for every single principal component. So what, <clears throat> the way to act to, to obtain these principal, principal components, the scores, there's two ways. Let me actually... Um, get some code running here so I can uh, show you some additional things. So if I say names PCA uh, dot save, what we see here are the components of the PCA dot save uh, object. And we see, for example, one called scores. So to access this, I can say pca.save dollar sign scores. That's going to give you 40, uh, for all 40 observations, three principal component scores. So how about we just look at it in terms of the head function so that we don't have everything printed out. And so let me now go back over to my Word file. What this .472 represents is why hat star 1, 1. So, first observation, first principal component score. The negative 0.44 is y hat star 1, 2. First observation, second principal component score. And then lastly, we have y hat star 1, 3. So, these scores are simply calculated for you. Um, <clears throat> here's another way you can get the scores. You can use the predict function. The predict function is a function, I think you've, you have seen this before, it's a, a function commonly used to, for example, when you're working with, let's say, regression models. If you want to predict y hat from a regular old normal linear regression model, you can use the predict function to give that to you. Well, since we're kind of doing the same thing here, uh, to some respect, we're forming a linear combination of variables, um, we can use the predict function with PCA.save and get exactly the same output. Okay. Well, let's just verify that R is doing these calculations correctly. Let's actually look at how we were to do these calculations by hand, you could say. Please make sure that you put a little hat on top of the Y. Uh, that same thing occurs, that same, my, my same mistake occurs on page 22 as well at the top. I forgot my hats on top of the Y's. And so let's look at the first observation, first principal component score. Let me do a split screen here for momentarily. So let me go back to my output that I originally have from the summary function. So here's my summary of PCA.save. We see the first 
loading is negative point six six negative point six six seven. So I'm going to put negative point six six seven. And actually, if you look at it a little bit closer, you'll notice that there's a one there as well. Um, and then I take it time. Well, what's my standardized value for the first observation, first variable? I'll remember how we find that. Oh, where did I put that? There we go. So remember to find standardized values. The easiest way to do that is to use the scale function. So I say scale with my sugar, fat, and sodium uh, values in my serial data set. I put in an object called Z. And then if I want to, uh, let's say, just extract uh, for the first observation, I say let's look at row 1 of Z. I put that in an object called Z1. Let's print it off. And so there's 0.45284, which goes right here. Next, I go to the second component, negative 0.5879. See that right there? Take it times then the standardized value for the second variable. I do the similar thing now for the third variable as well. And I get 0.4661. So, did R do the calculations right? Hopefully you all know what, um, I can't believe I just said you all. Oh boy. Hopefully you all know what to look at. Those are doing the calculations right. No, it's not. I'll tell you more about that shortly. Well, how would I actually, let's say, do these calculations here, not necessarily by hand, but with the help of, with the help of R, um, and actually do the matrix multiplication? Well, what I can do is I can uh, go to the loadings component of PCA.save. Just show you that. So those are all the, you see all the loadings there. And if I just say I want column one, this is what we get. Okay. I've already showed you how to find the first set of standardized values for the first observations. So now it's just a matter of matrix algebra. So notice again, I'm using percent star, I'm sorry, percent asterisk percent to do the matrix uh, multiplication. And there's my 0.4661. So on top of page um, 22, you see some of the similar calculations, and you'll notice that they do not match up with what's on the top of page 21. So why don't these scores match up? Now this was. Uh, caused me some frustration for a while. It's like, this is a simple calculation. Why, does it, why isn't R matching up here? Well, um, there's a few reasons. First of all, if you look in the help file for PrintCom, it says, quote, note that the default calculations uses divisor N for the covariance matrix. Well, what does that mean? Well, the way that we've always calculated the covariance, estimated covariance matrix, of course, if I'm talking about a covariance matrix here, that's with standardized values, of course, again, that's equivalent to the correlation matrix for standardized values and also for the original variables. This was the actual, this was the actual um, uh, covariance matrix formula. What R actually uses instead for some reason, which I do not know why, uses that instead. So what's the difference? This right here. So the bottom formula that we had always talked about before is the unbiased estimate of the covariance matrix. So essentially, that should be the best estimate. The top formula there is what's often referred to as the usual bias estimate of the covariance matrix. And this is what R is using. Okay. That's too bad because it makes our life our lives a little bit more difficult. Um, 
Now you might be wondering, well, you know, the, as, 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 we, as we showed last time, let me go back. If you remember when we looked at the output from the summary function last time, and we said, well, you know, you could just simply do the calculations using the eigenfunction to calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and they matched. Okay? Well, why did they match? Now, that's what's explained on page 23. Eventually, I'll get back there. Okay. So, when we specify, you know, use the correlation matrix. Remember how a correlation is found. It's a covariance between, let's just say, a variable uh, 1 and variable 2 over the square root of the variance of x1 times the variance of x2. Now, if you actually look at the formula, I'm not going to write it all out. You're going to have a in terms of how we've been doing it, we have 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of some stuff up there. It's not a statistical term, some stuff, but it works here very well to use that. And then we divide it by 1 over the square root of 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of some stuff, times the square root of 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of some stuff. What role does the 1 over n minus 1 end up playing? Well, no, but what happens to the 1 over n minus 1s here? They all cancel out. Okay. So, if I were to use then 1 over n or 1 over n minus 1, calculate my covariance matrix that way, or my correlation matrix, Say. It's not going to matter. I'm going to get exactly the same eigenvectors, which was displayed in the output. So, you know, this kind of confused me then. Well, what, what, why am I still getting scores that are different from what they should be? And that's where I had to actually go into the actual print comp function to figure out what's going on, go into the predict function, look at the code, and figure out what's going on. And what you will notice is when they find the scores, how they find the standardized values that they use in the scores is the key part. Um, they use the scale function to find the standardized values, but they specify when they do this a 1 over n. You're not responsible for the details of actually going into the function. You can if you want and look in, and look at it and see this. But essentially, the only place where it matters for us is these scores. Because when they find the standardized values, in other words, again, when they are finding this right here, they're using the bias variance then. When they are finding the standardized values. Okay. So how can we then use now the unbiased estimates? Is there a, a, a simple fix? Uh, to some respect, there is. Not too bad. Okay. To help explain how to do the fix. Let's see here. One of the components of PCA.save is one called scale. And this scale component contains the biased um, standard deviations. So it uses 1 over n versus 1 over n minus 1 in its calculations. And if you look closer at the predict function itself, what the predict function does, um, uh, it actually uses this information there to help do its calculations. So if we could simply to do some of its calculations, I should, I should clarify that. So if we could simply replace what's in the scale component with the unbiased estimates, we can get this all to work out. So this is how we can do it. 
Uh, I'm going to go kind of do a long, a longer way to do it first, and then you'll see a, a little bit simpler way to do it a second. So I'm going to, um, so I don't write over what's already in PCA.save. I'm going to create a new new object called PCA.save2. Okay. Then, hopefully you remember seeing this function in the, in the past in this course. We're going to use the apply function to calculate the unbiased standard deviations. So we use the apply function in the data distributions and correlation section. And simply just to review how the apply function works. I can apply a particular function R to any particular column or all columns of a matrix or I can apply it to all rows of a matrix. So in this particular case I'm going to extract out columns 8 through 10 of the serial data set. I'm going to apply the standard deviation function to each of those columns and the way it knows by I'm going to do by columns versus row is I specify margin equal 2. If you look at the help, 2 means column, 1 means rows. Okay? And so here are the unbiased estimates of the standard deviation. I need to get these now into PCA.save essentially, or PCA.save2. So the way I'm going to do that is simply immediately put them in there. So I'm going to say PCA.save2 dollar sign scale, replace what was there with now these new standard deviations. And just to verify that indeed that, that happens, there you go. Okay. Now, remember how the predict function gives you one way to find the PCA scores. Now, one of the nice things about using the predict function is that let's say if you had a new observation, you can actually use that to find the scores for this new observation itself. And we're going to essentially take advantage of that here. So if I say predict all my information is in PCA.save2, and then I use another argument called new data, where it's not, I'm not actually using new data, I'm using the original data, serial. So if I do that, look at the first six rows, and now, notice, I get the correct principal component scores. <coughs> okay. For a relatively minor issue here, you can see that it takes a while to do some of the, the coding. Um, here's a little bit easier way to do this. Just simply, with PCA.save, uh, the dollar sign scale, immediately put the results from apply in there, and then use the predict function. Okay? So on a test, what should you use? Well, you use the code that takes two lines versus the code that takes uh, five lines. Now you might be wondering, hopefully you are, well why couldn't I just simply have done this? Because after all, I am after my original data to begin with. And I had showed you at the very beginning of page 21 that there was no new data argument needed to get the scores. Well when R sees this, and this is in the, you, you, can see, you can see this by actually looking at the code. When R sees something like this, and you don't specify new data, the predict function will immediately go to PCA.save dollar sign scores to pull out the scores that were already calculated. It will actually go through the matrix algebra. The only way that you can force R to go through the matrix algebra is by actually saying the new data argument. Okay. Any questions? Again, it's a little bit more complicated than what it needs to be, but this is the way to do it. Um, I was kind of—I was—I had to admit I was disappointed and also frustrated when I saw how PrintComp was doing its calculations. Okay, let's see here. So, 
as I was kind of alluding to, maybe I should have actually done this first. Um, let's say that you do have a new observation and you want to find the corresponding PCA score, uh, the principal component scores for that new observation. So maybe you have a, a, a new serial that's come out and you want to know well, what will be the corresponding principal component scores. How could you do that? That's where then the predict function is the way to go. So here's my new observation. I decided to put it in a data frame. We call that data frame pred.set, for the lack of a better name. And this happens to be simply observation number one. It just, it just was easy to put in there. So I put in the observation number one values. Notice that these are not standardized. And then I say predict my stuff in PCA.say2. And then new data pred.set. And notice I get uh, one set of predictions. Or I should say I get one set of principal component scores. And these match what we were having through our by hand calculations. Okay. Let's see here. And then lastly, before we get to some, some other stuff, um, now remember that these principal components have a variance equal to the eigenvalues. And so just to verify that, how about we look at these, all these principal component scores that we calculated for our original data and simply find the variance for each principal component. So, similar to what I did before, I used the predict function with the adjusted PCA.save, put the results into save.score, and I say, well, let's apply now the variance function to each column of my save.score. And what do you know? The variance happens to be equal to then the corresponding eigenvalues. Well, where did I pull out these eigenvalues? Well, one component of PCA.save happens to be called SDEV for standard deviation. That's the square root of the lambda half stars. So if I square those, I get the eigenvalues. And we see how the Variances of the principal component scores match up with those estimated eigenvalues, as they should. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Sometimes the subject matter scientists would like the principal component scores to have the same directionality as your data, like high values of the raw data produce mm. high values in the first principal component. Yeah, well remember Is there something wrong with multiplying everything by minus one and just flipping the whole thing? You, you, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and uh, if, uh, <clears throat> again these, these eigenvectors are not unique, but they need to have a length of one. And so if you multiply the eigenvectors by negative one, you could get exactly what you want. And there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Obviously, though, in any kind of write-up, you need to be clear about what you've done. And I think if I, re if I remember right, uh, I actually, when I had taught this course before using SAS, um, I believe SAS actually did uh, have different eigenvectors, you know, like one of the, one of the eigenvectors multiplied by negative one uh, compared to what we had here. So... You know, so I guess that's a good thing to mention then, you know, if you use different software packages, don't be alarmed if you get different answers. You have to understand that, you know, these eigenvectors are not unique. And maybe one, one software package will have the exact same except for it's by, uh, multiplied by negative one, the eigenvector. Okay. So, now, with principal pull analysis, you can either use the correlation matrix of the original variables, which again is equivalent to the correlation matrix for the standardized variables, which is equivalent to the, co the covariance matrix of the standardized variables, or you could use the covariance matrix for the original variables. Now, why wouldn't we want to use the covariance matrix for the original variables for the serial data? For, I'm sorry, what? Why we don't want to use the covariance matrix for the serial data, the original variables? 
Exactly. So we can see here, sodium has a huge amount of variability in comparison to the others. And remember, and we had a discussion about this last time, remember how principal components approaches the problem. is looking for a linear combination of your original variables that maximizes the, the, the total amount of variance accounted for. So, let's look at all these var variances here. I could simply choose a linear combination of sugar, fat, and sodium that basically puts a weight of, let's say, 1 on sodium and 0 on sugar and fat. And the total amount of variance that I would account for is 6.06 .06 divided by about 6.07. Okay? Well, that's not very useful. And in fact, notice how then sugar has a lot higher variance than fat. So the second principal component that will be chosen is one that has all its weight on sugar, zero weight on fat, zero weight on sodium. That's not a very useful analysis. Because basically what's going to happen is your original variables will come right back to you as principal components, as we shall see shortly. So, <coughs> now I'm going to use the print comp function again to show how we could do the analysis using just the covariance matrix of the original variables. Now this is where it does matter uh, the fact that I'm going to use the covariance matrix. Uh, so it's going to use the bias covariance matrix when it calculates the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Um, but in the end, since I'm just kind of doing this for demonstration purposes, I don't think it's a real big deal. Um, I'm just showing you that indeed it's incorrect in this case to to use the covariance matrix. Here is then the biased version of the covariance matrix itself. So all I did was I multiplied by n minus 1 divided by n to get the biased version. Um, you know, that n minus 1 in the numerator essentially uh, removes the n minus 1 that's in the denominator of the, uh, that results from the co-function. And then I just slip another divide by n in there. My total possible variance using the uh, finding the trace of this bias covariance matrix. We've talked about traces before in the matrix algebra section, so I just apply that formula there, and I get 5.93. Okay, so to do the calculations with the covariance matrix, you need to set core equal false. The default is true. And then I summarize then the information that's in pca.cov. This is what I get. So notice that the first principal component accounts for 99.6% of the total variation. Well, what does the first principal component represent? Simply sodium. That's it. Second principal component represents just sugar. And third one represents just fat. Well, geez, that's a waste of time to do this because you're getting back your original data. But this is good to point this out, and the reason why I went through this demonstration was to show you that, you know, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, and if you're just using the covariance matrix here without accounting for the fact that these variables could have uh, different amounts of variability, you can get back just simply your original data, which is, I don't think, the purpose of any kind of principal component analysis. Or you could, let's say, blindly think, well, geez, my first principal component does such a good job, that's all I need. Well... All it is is giving you sodium back. Okay. <clears throat> and lastly, one thing I, I, I realized, or two things that I realized I skipped over, unfortunately, because I should have been looking at my notes more. Um, okay, so is it really a big deal to have a covariance matrix that has 1 over n um, in its calculation or 1 over n minus 1? Is it really a big deal? It depends. It depends. What does it depend on? How big N is. It depends upon how big N is. So, if you have a large sample size, do you think it's going to make a, a big deal? No. If you have a smaller sample size, yeah, it can make a little, little bit of a difference. It's not going to make that big of a difference in the end, unless you have a sample size of three. But why would you be doing this if you only had a sample size of three to begin with? Uh, so. You know, even though you know we spend a lot of time, you know, talking about um, uh, 
you know, how to fix the problem. It's really not that big. I do want you to fix the problem in this class. If outside this class you don't really care, no, I can't change your grade. So. But at least in this class, I do want to use the unbiased uh, covariance matrix whenever possible uh, to do these calculations. Okay, also there's one other thing I, uh, I'm sorry, something else. Um, okay, last time, you might remember how we were talking about how the summary function is a generic function. And so when I say summary pca.say, what's happening is actually another function is being calculated, uh, being used called summary.printcom. This gets into the whole idea of how R works. We have these generic functions, one of them is summary, and whenever a generic function is uh, run, it looks at, well, what's the, uh, the class of the object that you put in there? In this case, the class happens to be printcom. And so when R realizes that, it says, okay, I'm going to go find a function called summary.printcomp and actually run that function. So last time I said summary.printcomp, and I tried to do the same thing, and I got an error message. Now, one way to find a function in R is to use the function called get anywhere. So I say get anywhere dot print, uh, summary dot print comp. Unfortunately, there are certain functions that are hidden in R uh, because normally a person wouldn't call them directly, uh, except for for demonstration purposes, like in a class setting like this. And so they actually see if there is a function out there called summary dot print comp, and you say get anywhere, and indeed the function comes up. Now, why didn't it work then when I did this? Because this function is there. Well, I'm not for sure exactly why um, doing this kind of a call did not work. I, and I don't know how this, this, this has happened, but the authors have somehow hit it in a way that you cannot call it directly. I, I'm not, I have not seen that before. But there is still a way that you can get at that function and use it directly. And here's the code. The function summary.printcomp lies in the stats package. And so if I say stats colon colon colon, <laughs> weird syntax, summary.printcomp, what that does, it forces R to look in the stats package and actually pull out the function itself. So you see that there. And then if I say save, or what did I call it? PCA.save. Now I can execute it. Odd syntax, but this is how you could do it. Will you ever need to do this usually in application? No. It's more, I'm showing you this here to help you learn how R is organized. Any questions about that? Okay, and then there was something that we did skip on page 14 that I wanted to go back to. Sorry to be doing that. Okay, as we saw, you know, these, these eigenvectors, again, uh, the components are often called loadings, they're very important for interpreting a principal component, what they represent. And so we've already talked about this first paragraph here where you can look at the, print, the, the loadings. If they're close to zero, then that says a particular uh, variable, original variable, does not have much of an effect on what the principal component is. If it's one, I mean, if it's, po if it's uh, away from zero, if it's positive or if it's negative, then it says it has a different kind of effect. Sometimes, though, so that's within one we were looking at in terms of Let's look at the first principal component. Let's look at then the loadings. Sometimes, though, people like to make comparisons of loadings across the different eigenvectors. In other words, across the different principal components. The problem with doing that is that the principal component number one accounts for a lot more variability than principal component number two. So a value of, let's say, positive 0.5 as a loading for principal component number one has a different significance 
than uh, positive 0.5 from the second CRISPR component because that accounts for less variability in your data. So to help adjust for that so that you can make, let's say, um, um, good comparisons between the different principal components, what people will often do is rescale the, um, these eigenvectors. Rescale them based upon what the eigenvalues are. That makes sense because the eigenvalues represent the variances for the principal components. And then they interpret then what are called then the component loading vectors um, and, and, and compare them from one principal component to the next. Some people do that. I never have found a use for that, to be honest, but some people do do that. Also, interesting result comes about from doing this, a little rescaling. The correlation between, let's say, the ith original standardized variable with the jth component, uh, principal component is essentially this rescaled value. That's the correlation. I go through a proof of that that I would like you to take a look at on your own. Okay. Now we can get back to where we left off, page 27. Are there any questions? Yes. I get. Um, I, I need. I, I'm sorry. Could you please restate your question? Because I'm not for sure when, when you're talking about significant variables. What's the relation between the number of components you use in the example and also in the number of how many significant variables in one component? I, th I think your question real, uh, is with respect to how many uh, principal components do you want to use for a particular problem? And also in one component, how many variables? Well, you're still going to be using for every principal component. When you do the calculation, when you find that linear combination, you're still having all the variables in there, no matter what. What we were doing was we were looking at then the coefficients on this linear combination, these loadings, which are the basically the eigenvectors. We're looking at that to try to interpret what a principal component represent, represents. So, for example, the second principal component Oops, where is that? For the serial data set, and my, my stuff is really messy here. <laughs> the second principal component showed us that sugar did not play a big role at all. I'm not saying, I'm not throwing away sugar, but it's not playing a big role at all in finding the second principal component. So that second principal component basically represents fat and sodium. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Okay, we can talk about it more after class if you want. Okay, let's look at another problem where principal component analysis is um, actually useful. This is with that goblet data set that we've uh, looked at uh, in the data distributions and correlation section. Um, and also you uh, did some homework problems with the goblet data set already. So just as a, as, a, as a reminder of what this goblet data set represents, here's a goblet. And uh, we, are, we take six different measurements on these goblets. These goblets come from an archaeological uh, uh, dig site. And the uh, subject matter researchers, maybe archaeologists, uh, are interested in um, coming up with some kind of grouping mechanism uh, based upon these measurements on these goblets. So maybe, you know, you can find some goblets that look a particular way, um, call that one group, another set of goblets that look a, a different way, call that another group. And I would imagine that the reason why that's of interest is because depending upon how the goblet look, looks, it could have a different use in the past. <clears throat> So, X3 is the overall height. Uh, X1 is the opening on the top of the goblet. How big is it? X2 is the width of the, of the cup of the goblet. X4 is the uh, width of, of the base when it, it touches, let's say, a table or, 
for wherever it's setting up. X5 is the width then of the connection between the base and the cup of the goblet in terms of the width. And X6 is the height of the, uh, of, of the base. Okay. Now, the subject matter researchers were interested in, again, uh, coming up with grouping mechanisms, uh, grouping, uh, groupings of these goblets. Uh, but they uh, wanted to have goblets that were the same shape, but maybe a different overall, let's say, size, uh, to always be in the same group. And so one way to account for that was uh, perhaps would be to uh, divide each of your each of the variables by the overall height. So the actual data set that we're going to be looking at is, for example, we're going to have W1 is going to be equal to X1 divided by X3. W2 is going to be X2 divided by X3, and so on. So we have a, this adjusted. So we're going to have five variables in the end. So how can I do the, the adjustment in R? Well, simply, of course, I read in my data, and then I form a new data frame, which I call goblet2. And I'm going to have the first column in that data frame correspond to the, uh, some kind of identification number. And I'm just going to pull out the goblet variable, the goblet data set. Um, and uh, here's how I find W1. Pull out X1 from the goblet data set, divide by uh, X3 of the goblet data set. And so that this is then the actual data that I'm going to be working with. Okay. Now, whenever you get a new data set like this, it's good to do some initial investigations into the data. So for the graphic section homework, hopefully you already worked on this, I asked you to do some plots of the, of the, uh, of the goblet data set. One particular plot that would be useful in this setting is to use a stars plot. And here's my stars plot. Okay. Now, again, in the context of wanting to find some kind of uh, groupings of your data, I'm sorry, groupings of the goblets, that might be a better way to put emphasis on it, to find groupings of the goblets, uh, what, what stands out here in the this, in this stars plot? Are there some, some goblets there that you would think would be grouped together? Four and five, definitely. Maybe with 17 as well. Okay. Well, let's not do yellow. Purple. Excuse me? 23 and 24. Yeah. Notice how they have a big W1 and W2s. That corresponds to the cup, the top of the goblet. But they seem to have relatively... Uh, smaller bottoms. Don't really necessarily see any other ones like that. How about other groupings? Three, 16, so three, sixteen, maybe eighteen. You know, I'm a little bit concerned with that part there. We'll, we'll go ahead and put it there. Um, one, one that I see. How about 20 and 25? Maybe with 11 and 11. Let's see. Yeah? Seven. Yeah? So, so anyway, so we see some stuff that pop out to us in the stars plot. So that, that's, that's good. Um, and uh, hopefully then in the, in, in the principal component analysis, we'll see some stuff like that. And in fact, we will. That's why I went through this process. Um, and we'll see how it's represented in terms of principal components. Now, another useful plot then to do in this situation is the parallel coordinates plot. Uh, do note that I was a little sloppy in my syntax here. And I should have uh, wrote in those particular words. Um, and there's a variety of different ways that you could do the parallel coordinates plot in this situation. Um, what I actually did was I used those interactive parallel coordinates plots where you could brush. If you remember doing the brushing, where you could brush some of the lines so you could see maybe particular trends that pop out. Um, I did that first, and I saw some interesting trends that pop out, so I decided to show those trends using simply the par chord function itself. It's not an interactive plots uh, package. And so what I decided to do was, 
basically for W5 itself, that is the connection between the base and the cup of the goblet in terms of the width, um, I decided to divide uh, the data up by the median. Uh, so make an artificial classification. So I say, if else, I'm going to test, is W5 less than or equal to the median of W5? If it is, I'm going to assign it a color of red. If it's not, I'll assign it a color of blue. Put that into call w 5 so that then when I call my parkour function, I put that in there as a color. Okay. So, <clears throat> now if I were to do this plot over again, I would not put a negative 1 there. The reason being because what that's going to do, and why don't I just go ahead and do that. Yeah, let's see. That. There we go. Because now I also I have the identification number listed there, so we can see well which observations are we talking about. Uh, to some respect. So that's what I would have done. Let me go ahead and copy this over to a Word file so I can write on the plot. Okay. So what we see here, for example. Now, remember how I divided the, the uh, two colors up was based upon the median. So we can see the median then would be right about here for W5. But notice how, generally speaking, for all the variables, um, the blues, um, well, I guess for some of the variables, uh, the blues tend to be always high for the other variables too. So what that means is that if you have a large uh, connection between the base and the cup, Typically, the other variables are also going to be large. So that's an interesting trend to see here. Maybe we'll see that trend pop up later um, in principal component analysis or in other analyses that we do. So what I mean by that, just to make sure it's emphasized, notice how W2, all the blue are up high, but not necessarily all the red. Um, to some respect, W4 as well. So again, you know, I didn't necessarily find that, see that immediately the first plot I did. You know, I, I used a few different plots to see those kinds of trends. Let's look at some other stuff too. Notice here, I have some larger W1 values. And if I look across here, I have a large W2 value. They end up being large W4 values. They end up being uh, somewhat large W5 values and also W6 values too. Okay. So what that means is I have some goblets that are, seem to be large overall for all the variables. And if we're thinking about grouping similar goblets together, that's an important finding. Um, well, what observations are these? Well, let's take a look at the ID here. So this would be 1. Two, three, four, five. Let's go back to the stars plot. Ah, remember that four and five that immediately popped out to us? It's kind of big. Well, that's what we see in the parallel coordinates plot, too. It's just we're seeing it in a different way. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, let's see now. Well, what you see here, for example, take a look at those points there. 
you know, they tend to, not all of them, tend to also be there, tend to also be there, uh, tend to be also down here, and then they distribute, or they're, they're quite dispersed there. But what we see here is that uh, we have a set of observations that tend to always have smaller W1, W2, W4, and W5 values, but not necessarily W6. So again, you might think that these might come out as being grouped together as well. And you'll again see that in some of our principal component score plots. So there's a variety of things that you can look at in this plot. I urge you to do that and relate that to the stars plot as well. Okay. So, in this particular data set, there is justification for either the correlation matrix or using the covariance matrix. Why do you think the covariance matrix would be perhaps okay to use in this setting? Exactly. All of our stuff, all of our variables, are measured in the same units. So this is one of the few places where it would be okay to use the covariance matrix that is justified. But just realize, and we will actually use the covariance matrix later, just realize that some variables might play a bigger role than other variables because the variances are not the same. If you actually look at the covariance matrix, the variances are not the same. What we're going to do is actually begin with taking a look at the correlation matrix uh, approach. Oops. <clears throat> okay, so print comp, formula equal. I put in my variables. Here's my goblet 2 data set. I'm going to use the correlation matrix, and I don't want to calculate scores because we're going to calculate scores that other way that I have shown you before. Put the results in PCA.score. Let's summarize the results. So here's a lambda hat star 1 square root. Notice that it counts for 61% of the variation in your data. That's pretty good. But that says that only one principal component will count for over half of the information that you have available to you in this data set. Look at principal component number two. Here's lambda hat star two. It's 1.13. It accounts for 26% of the variation. And if you add that to what we had for principal component number one, we now have about 87%. So we had five variables to begin with. But if we work with just two principal components, we can count for 87% of the total variation of the data, the total information that's available in our data set. Because of that, you might just be able to get away with just using two principal components, and that's it. If you wanted a little bit more, you know, if you went to the third principal component, you get up to 95%. And definitely not three principal components would be enough. Some other things to think about, though, if you did go with that third principal component, notice that its corresponding estimated eigenvalue is less than 1. So it actually accounts for less variation than an original variable. In this setting, I would most likely just go with 2. 87% is pretty good. I will show you what happens when you go with 3 as well, just to demonstrate. Uh, but I would go with two. And I did not actually produce the screen plot, but you can imagine what the screen plot would look like. That you know these eigenvalues for three, four, and five are leveling off, kind of getting close to zero. Try a screen plot on your own to see that. Let's uh, quickly do then the uh, interpretation of what these principal components represent. So let's look at principal component number one. Notice we have all positive values, but not necessarily close to zero. So what this says is that principal component number one is kind of a measure of the overall size of the goblet, taking into account the height, because we remember how we divide everything by the height. What's well, a measure of the overall size of the goblet? Excuse me? Width. I'm sorry, the, the overall yeah, size. Yeah, to be divided by height. Essentially, it is, it is a measure of width, too. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah. Um, principal component number two. Okay, remember, 
W1 and W2 correspond to the top of the goblet, the cup portion. Uh, I'm sorry. W, yeah, W1 and W2 correspond to the top portion. W4 and W6, W4 and W6 correspond to the bottom. Notice how W5 is essentially very close to zero. So what we're doing is contrasting the cup, the top of the goblet, to two of the measurements in the base. That's how you um, interpret principle component number two. You know, hopefully, again, to an archaeologist or whomever collected this data, that would make sense to them. Like, oh yeah, that makes, you know, you know, that corresponds to the uses of goblets. I'm not a goblet expert, so I can't comment on that, but that's what you can say. Uh, now, principle component number three. Now, this is a, the, the meaning is not quite as, as good as it was for one and two. Um, you know, again, you have for the top of the goblet, positive values, but you also have this W6, which is in the bottom of the goblet, too. It has a positive value. And it's a contrast between those and W4 and W5, which represent the bottom. Um, so you can say it's a contrast between W1, W2, W6 versus W4 and W5. But that's probably as far as you can go, unless you were a goblet expert and you knew why that made sense. Okay. Fortunately, we are out of time. Are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today.